Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment. Uh, my name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is Armin Navabi. Armin, how are you doing? Good, good. Just I was just checking the idea. I'm good. You're checking the audio. You're good. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so uh, today, and I again, I'm going to get right into this because uh, we've got so much to get to, and I, I don't want to waste any time. But um, today, we're joined by uh, actually one of my favorite writers. Um, this is Graham Wood. Uh, he is a contributing editor uh, for The Atlantic. Um, he is also a lecturer at Yale University. He wrote one of the most widely read articles in The Atlantic's history called What ISIS Really Wants. And he's also the author of uh, a, a great book uh, called The Way of the Strangers, Encounters with the Islamic State. Um, and Graham, welcome to the podcast. And thank you. It's truly an honor to have you with us. Oh, it's good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So I wanted to start with just saying that you have a fascinating life. Right. So one thing that uh, so you know you graduated from Harvard. Uh, you reported from Cambodia. You you were in uh, uh, the Middle East for several years. You were in Mosul, Iraq. And you wrote about a little bit of that in your book in the early two thousands uh, during the Iraq War. Um, and uh, you know you have met many many jihadists or many sympathizers of jihadists. Uh, and you know you you seem to have a very very good insight into it. And us, uh, Armin and I, are both from the Muslim world. So, you know, when, when we read it, we, it's, it's amazing the depth of your knowledge and the kind of experience that you've had. But, and you've also, you also went to school with Richard Spencer, which yes. is just something that we're going to get into uh, later as well. We'd love to ask you about that. But I, I wanted to start with something that's recently been um, in the news. All right. So, uh, as of the recording of this podcast, just about a day ago, uh, there was an attack an ISIS attack, ISIS claimed attack in Syria, where uh, um, among several people, four Americans were killed as well. And this happened essentially within a day of um, uh, Donald Trump saying that ISIS has been defeated and Mike Pence saying the same thing. So I guess we would start with that. Has ISIS been defeated? Uh, well, no. Um, in a in a in a sense, ISIS is not what ISIS once was. It's what ISIS was even before that. You know, we think of ISIS as being this terrorist empire that inspires thousands of people, that has population that that, that is in the millions, um, and it's not that anymore. No. So, if we want to say that ISIS is defeated, um, you know, the the actual grammar of the question I find kind of interesting. Like, it's it's actually a kind of very American, maybe very North American way of seeing um, wars as wars that end. The, the very idea that, that wars finish rather than go on in different forms as time goes by is, is the kind of illusion that, 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 that we have thinking of something like World War II where Nazi Germany is absolutely pulverized. And with ISIS, it's more like I think um, some of the wars of, of, of years past that that are more familiar to people of the Middle East, Europe, um, in a, in a different era, where the war goes on in a different way. So yes, ISIS has, has lost its land-based caliphate, except in small pockets. Um, it has lost its ability to inspire people too. So has ISIS been defeated in that sense? Yes. But in the following sense, no. First of all, those land, those, those pockets of land that it still holds in Mesopotamia have probably thousands of people in them, uh, thousands of fighters. Uh, we've, we've, we've recently heard from uh, one captured Canadian, Canadian jihadist there. So in that right, sense, yeah. we've there, got, a, I think it's video. still going yeah. on. And then also in the sense of, of inspiration, you know, the, there are fewer people who have gone to follow ISIS, people who have crossed borders, people who have bought plane tickets 
But remember, ISIS, even when ISIS did control land, it was not telling them to do that anymore. It, it had already, two years ago, told us, told its followers and us that it was going to change its its MO. So it's not defeated at all. It, it, it still has people who follow it. It still has, um, even people who think it's wrong said, it got pretty far. It's the model for us in the future. So no, it's still a going concern. And overall, I'd say it's it's not defeated, but even thinking of it in terms of victory or defeat is, I, I think, maybe the wrong way to go about it. And it, it started with, uh, so when ISIS was beginning at that point, you know, before that we had Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, you had Abu Musaba, Zorqawi in Iraq, and um, ISIS rose from that. Now it, almost, it, it was almost, I think, uh, it morphed into ISIS in a way. Uh, and many people were talking about Al-Qaeda. They haven't been defeated. And then this new thing comes up that it's uh, even more deadly. And, um, you know, had obviously the entire world was really in terror with, you know, the, all of the images that were coming out. It was more uh, slick. They were more sort of millennial, I guess, in a way. Um, their videos were slickly produced. Uh, you know, it, it was really, really jarring. Um, and, you know, I remember when people were celebrating that Osama bin Laden had been you know, we've taken them out. So is this, I guess, in a way, it goes to the point of what you're saying about when it's been defeated. Um, when you said that they said that they're, they're saying that they're changing their MO, what could the next MO be? What do you see it as being, I guess, the next? Well, I, I, so it's, it's a few things. First of all, we need to see what it used to be before it became ISIS. And you correctly noted that Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was the kind of predecessor, the, 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 the spiritual ancestor and, you know, operational ancestor of, of the group. But as of 2011, if you were to look at what Al Qaeda had, be, had become, the group that, that was that seed that grew into ISIS was much smaller, much more beleaguered, much more destroyed, I think, than what, what ISIS is right now. So what ISIS itself ha- has, openly said that it planned to do was to continue to hold small amounts of land. Remember, it has already expanded to other continents, places where it still has land there as well. And then after that retreat into the desert in Mesopotamia, return to the strength that it once had. Its bet is that whoever holds that that territory after ISIS, whether it be Bashar al-Assad or Syrian rebels or Kurds or Iraqi militias, they will not be able to hold it in a way that will satisfy the population, which is largely Arab and Sunni. And so they say, our bet is they, these occupiers, as, as they would think of them, will lose and we'll be there. We'll be back. We'll be back just as we were before. We will we'll be retreating, trying to kind of lick our wounds for a little while and then make sure that once once we come back in force, we will come back in even greater force than we had in 2014, 15, 16. So, so when, when ISIS originally became so big, to a lot of people, it seemed like it just came out of nowhere and it became so big so fast and it became the major, uh, the major problem in the Middle East, uh, overnight. But, but the, the, but what made ISIS so big and so popular, the underlying reasons behind it is part of a much bigger trend that, like, that was happening way before, and it was much of an. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's, it was part of a bigger movement uh, that it eventually manifested itself in 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 the shape of ISIS. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, that's right. I, yeah. I, I think yeah. If you were paying attention to jihadism before uh, before ISIS came into the news, and if you certainly if you're speaking to a certain strain of jihadi Salafis. You would, when ISIS started putting its propaganda out, be able to say, I think I've heard this line before. I think I've heard them say something kind of like this before. So, yeah, ISIS was the ex- a publicity explosion of a movement that had existed in a very small minority form, but, def- but a, a, a significant minority for a long time. It was fam- a familiar entity. So that, that movement, which is the underlying foundation behind ISIS, that movement has not gone away. Even if the label, the people that label themselves ISIS uh, are less than before and they have less power than before, what gave birth to ISIS, that is still as popular as ever, isn't it? I don't know if it's as popular as ever. When they, One of the things they would say is 
if we just create a unitary Muslim state, a single uh, under a single imam, then every problem will be solved. So that obviously didn't work out for them. So some of them might be experiencing some cognitive dissonance here. Mm. But it is true that that um, for as long, almost as long as there has been Islam, there has been a, an idea that Muslims should live in a Muslim state under a single leader, which ISIS called a caliph. So, yeah, it would be very surprising if, if that dream died out just because this one manifestation of it turned out to, to not uh, be as durable as a lot of people thought it was. So given that that's the underlying um, motive behind creating groups like ISIS, would, wouldn't you see that the, the battle against such um, forces is it's not just a military battle, it's also an ideological battle that, that has to be won? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we need to think of it as an ideological battle. Like w- when we when we look at, you know, what are the hard questions about ISIS? Uh, they include things like, all right, well, how did it get to be so big? Why wasn't it just a little cult that, mm-hmm. that had a few people in the desert? And these questions include questions like, what were the thoughts that they had? Where did they get those ideas? They didn't come out of nowhere. What's the sociology of knowledge that that brings those ideas into those people's heads? And then, what are the things that makes that the 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 existence of those ideas turn into action, turn into bl- buying the plane ticket and going to to Raqqa? So, yeah, one very very important component of that is the ideological component. But of course, if we could find a way for people to long for a caliphate, but continue working at Starbucks or whatever and being well-behaved citizens of, of their their home countries then I would I would accept that that's that's fine unfortunately these these ideas seem to inspire a lot of people to, to act and so we have to figure out where the ideas come from and then all the subsequent questions about how they turn into action terrorism death genocide slavery so uh, can you can you dig- get into that maybe like the, where do these ideas come from and in, in, uh, when when you have talked to i know in in your book you mentioned several people that you talked to um you know one of them was uh, musa ser antonio i think i'm pronouncing is that, am i pronouncing that correctly yeah um, yeah so he was uh you met him in australia and he was a, he was a, an he's an isis sympathizer uh, you also talk about uh, meeting the family of uh john georgilas who's now yahya al bahrumi you know and uh for all we know at least from my knowledge recently is that he's still in Syria. He's still still over there, and we had his uh, his ex wife Tanya Joya, who you wrote about, and I kind of got to know her through you. Um, she is uh, she's been a previous guest on the podcast as well. Uh, so uh, you know, when you when you talk to these people and you've had many encounters in them with them, uh, what's the common denominator? What what is the? I mean, we we know that we we talk about the religion being the primary. Uh, driving force, or what? At least one of the main driving forces, and uh, and even in your article, uh, you know what ISIS really wants. You talked about how ISIS is not just Islamic; it's very Islamic. Um, so, to to what extent is the ideology rooted in the religion? And w- what do you say to people who say that uh, it doesn't have to do with Islam or it's not true Islam? Yeah, so there's a a few different ways people might say that it doesn't have to do with Islam. And one way would just be be to say, oh, that's not my Islam. That's not the way that I, as a Muslim, am speaking the voice of a Muslim here, this is not the way I think of my my religion, which is what most Muslims worldwide would say. And I have no problem with that. If if a Muslim wants to say that ISIS does not represent what what he or she believes its religion says, then okay, that's fine. I, I it's not for me to 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 argue, um, but then there's another way that it, it said, which is to say that it has nothing to do with Islam and has no it, it has nothing to do with any version of Islam that has ever existed. It has nothing to do with the texts that are foundational to to Islam, and that's a factual claim that Muslims and non-Muslims can both look into and have opinions about and have evidence for or against it. And I think it's a factually incorrect claim. And the idea that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam is just belied by all versions of Muslim history that, that are, have classically been believed by Muslims and that learned Muslims to this day would, would agree are part of their history. Um, right. Now, it's, 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 I think, surprising to most Muslims, especially Muslims in Western countries, 
that this has historically been part of the religion. But it, it, it shouldn't be. I mean, it, it's not something that has been hidden from, from um, you know, the Muslim scholars. It, it's not something that, that learned Muslims would be ignorant of. Um, and it's also not too surprising. I mean, Islam, as both of you know full well, it arose in late antiquity when a lot of practices existed that we would consider ab- abominations today. Um, right. Things like slavery, thing, things, like, norms of, of 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 war. So, what a shock that yeah, when ISIS comes along and then tries to revive what it thinks of uh, as true Islam, and then looks back to those sources, they're going to find exactly those practices of late antiquity, which of course were shared by Christians and and pretty much everyone else. So, taking captives as slaves that doesn't. It's not a very high priority for your average Muslim in any part of the world today. But if you're a Muslim who has this this desire to go back to the exact practices of the earliest Muslims, then yeah, they're going to find much historical evidence that Muslims were doing this. And in fact, we're proud of it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so, so go ahead. going to the, sorry, going to this being an ideological battle, to me, it seemed I, I don't correct me if I'm wrong about uh, any of this. To me, it seems like when during the Cold War, when United States was uh, trying to defeat uh, the Soviet Union and communism, they completely understood that this is not just a military battle; this is an ideological battle, and then they they won that ideological battle. They they like capitalism won over communism, not 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 just through military might, but through the hearts and minds of people. People just saw the difference between the performance and it was, they were convinced that this the, the, this model that the United States has is a better model. Um, but now it seems like they're very shy about doing the same thing when it comes to fighting an Islamic ideology. They seem to just focus only uh, as, a, as a military battle, right? And like they, they don't, they don't even touch uh, touch it as an ideological battle. Is that the yeah, sense that you it, have? Yeah, it's almost like tactical in a way, rather yeah, I, than strategic. Armin, I, I I think the comparison is even stronger than than you you make it sound between the way we thought about ideology in the Cold War and the way we think about it with with ISIS. Um, in part because it shows what the limitations of thinking about ideology are. So. If you tried to understand what the project was of the communist internationalist Soviet Union, and you didn't know anything about what communism was, you'd never heard of Karl Marx, you'd never read anything by Lenin, I think you'd be pretty confused by trying to figure out you know, why is this something that, that uh, many people think was a good idea? Why is this something that, that people were traveling from their home countries to go join? Um, it would seem weird to you. Now, on the other hand, if you tried to defeat communism by reading Karl Marx or by reading, reading Lenin, you also wouldn't get too far. You'd need to know a lot more than that. But what were, the status that, that we were in a couple of years ago when ISIS really was, was grabbing headlines absolutely everywhere was the equivalent of trying to understand the Soviet Union without knowing what communism was. Mm. Uh, it's it's it would be a it would be a, a transparently silly thing to do to to try to say oh well the communists have it wrong and then say oh well what is communism I'm not sure I, it, it's 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 something apparently no you you need to educate yourself about these things and then that'll bring you to the next step in that struggle right one thing one thing I I try to do and I don't know if this is effective or not to to be taken more seriously when we are when we point how ISIS is Islamic is to also try to point to where ISIS does some barbaric shit that we can't see how is that Islamic. Uh, and by pointing the parts that we think that doesn't seem very Islamic, then we get people trust us when we point out that this is actually Islamic. So and I don't know let me know because you you know you have studied this more than I have. So let me know what you think. Well, for example, when when ISIS was beheading those Christians on the beach, I I thought this is not Islamic. They are Ahlul Kitab. They are people of the book. They can't just, according to Islam, 
you can't just kill people of the Abrahamic faith. Maybe if they were Hindu, maybe if they were atheists uh, or Buddhists or what something, you could just randomly start killing them, which is also barbaric. But this is not very Islamic. Where they, I don't think they were offered to convert to Islam. Are you telling me all those Christians over there, they decided to like, no, I'm going to stick with Christianity. I'm not going to leave and I'm not going to pay the jizya. I'm just going to stick by Christianity. I'm not, and that's why they're beheading them because if they did not offer any of that to them, then this is very un-Islamic. What, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I'd also add to that when I saw the video of them, when they set that Jordanian pilot on fire. Well, right. I mean... I I couldn't even I couldn't even see that video. I still haven't properly seen it. But um, it's uh, when I saw that, I actually had to look up. I'm like, where are they getting it from? And then I I did find some references of it. I mean, and 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 these are things that I wasn't aware of. So it seems like they're really digging in any type of justification they can find. They so so yeah. I I think that's a yeah that's a good question. Like, they, have you seen anything that they do that is uh. Even people like us, you know, we look at it and we say, well, that doesn't seem Islamic. Yeah, th- there's there's lots of things they do that um, are, let's see, how should I put it? They're excused by very small minority interpretations of Islam. Mm. Um, usually those very small minority interpretations are not purely modern interpretations. So it, it wouldn't be fair to them, to ISIS, to say that they're just creating these interpretations out of whole cloth, that they're finding this minority report among the fatawa that, that says they can do it, that um, that they're not doing some homework in, in this regard. So burning the pilot would be a, a pretty classic example where if you if you were to ask the average sheikh who thought about these issues, which is very few sheikhs who, who think about the question of whether it's okay to burn someone alive, but say you ask, is it okay? The most commonly known um, uh, uh, proscription of it is one that says that burning is a punishment that's reserved for God. This is what God can do for you. Right, exactly. Hereafter. Yeah. So you can't do it. Well, it turns out there are... Um, cases where uh, the companions of the prophet burn people alive. Uh, And typically it is excused, and it was excused in the case of the Jordanian pilot on the basis of reciprocity. So they said, usually we wouldn't be doing this. This You you can't just uh, yeah, you you can't just burn someone because you want to watch them dance while soaked in gasoline. (laughs) Instead, what you have to do is burn someone only if he has burned someone else, which they said, and, and I would, would strongly discourage any viewer from looking at that video. I did. But if you do, I'm sorry to hear that because it, it haunted my dreams as well. Okay. If if you see the video, they not only do they um, make a big point of this, like they say the guy who lights the match uh, is the leader of a battalion that was um, decimated by Jordanian airstrikes. Uh, they were burned, so they're going to burn him right back. And then when this guy is um, is is then um, he, he loses consciousness, having been mostly um, sizzled alive, they then take a front-end loader full of rocks and um, crush him with it, which they say, yeah, that's what happened to us. You dropped firebombs on us, and then we died because our the structures that we were hiding in collapsed on us. So wow. you're going to die exactly the same way. Again, there's one interpretation which is best known, which is, no, you can never do this. And then they take this minority interpretation, which says, you can do it, but only in cases where reciprocity calls for it. Now, w- with the Christians who are beheaded on the beach, I'm sorry, Armin, you... No, no, we, go ahead. We, um, that's a that's a tougher case. I, I don't know the specifics of, of what they offered to them. It's true that that uh, when prisoners are taken captive um, in classical law, this, and this is not something that 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 was um, when Muslim laws of war were when when there was an expansive expanding caliphate in in, in centuries past. There is usually a, a few options of of what the victor, the Muslim victor, could do with them, which is. Uh, you could kill them, you could you could ransom them, offer them to, to be, or you could free them, or you could enslave them. So killing was was in, indeed one of the options if they were taken in battle. So what I imagine ISIS's uh, response to to 
to the objection that no, these are Christian, they're people of the book, they're to be respected, uh, is that, yeah, they might be people of the book, but either they personally or the, the, the countries that, that they're taken to represent uh, are at war with us. And it's true, those countries are at war with ISIS and, and, and good for them, but that puts the, the, the captives in a very unpleasant circumstance of, of hoping that ISIS chooses one of the nicer of those few options that have classically been available to, to, uh, to Muslim armies that, that, that take, um, take captives from the vanquished. The, 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 this is the problem uh, we have with the Quran and the Hadith, is especially the Hadith, because there's so much there that you could you could basically get whatever you want out of it, as 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 long as you dig enough. But uh, and and the text in the Quran is vague enough for you to be able to excuse anything. And other people try to point out, well, you could interpret the whole thing in a nice way and get some good stuff out of it. Uh, well, some verses is vague enough for you to be able to do that. Some verses aren't, but as long as you could use it as an excuse for, um, for, for such crimes, it's, it's basically not the, the source itself seems to be the problem. I mean, if, if even the vagueness of it is, it makes it such a, like, obviously there are some verses and some had these that are pretty black and white, uh, and their barbarity, but, but even the ones that are vague, the fact that they could, yeah, you could get something nice out of it. But the fact that you could also get something, justify something terrible out of it is makes them problematic, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the the way you put it, 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 it does sound like you're accusing ISIS or other jihadists of cherry picking verses. And no. like, it, and I, I do think that their interpretations are, are, they're not reaching that far to, to, to get those interpretations. And I don't mean they're not reaching that far just logically based on the text, but also historically. I mean, it's, it's not been that long since slavery was the norm, not just in the Muslim world, but just in the world. And so it's totally unsurprising that ISIS w would find laws concerning slavery that, that have been, uh, in abeyance for, for, Right. All, almost almost our entire lifetimes uh, and be able to find them. What, what they haven't had to do, though, is really torture those interpretations. They've been able to find what would be the standard interpretation of in, in a, a book of the fiqh of jihad, say, of a couple hundred years ago. It, it wouldn't even be a, a matter of, of question whether you could take a vanquished soldier as, as a slave. Like, obviously you can. So it's nope. it's they they didn't have to really stretch to do that. To to clarify, I I I myself think that the, what what the jihadists are getting out of the Quran and Hadith is the most plausible reading. Like their understanding of the Quran and the Hadith is the most plausible reading. Yeah, plausible the, literal reading. Literal yeah. reading of the text. I'm just trying to be even if what I'm trying to say is that even if we are being very charitable to the people that are saying that this Islam could also be the source of good. What I'm saying, even the most charitable reading of it, the fact that you have to do so much work and cherry picking for you to be able to get a moderate version of it, for me, makes this text already problematic. Because even if it was 50-50, it's still a problem, which is not the most, you know, as you pointed out. Yeah, well, yeah. when you're talking about inerrancy and infallibility, then, you know, you, you can't really go 50-50, yeah, especially, I you know, if we're talking about really pious and hardcore believers. What do yeah. you, what, when, so some, if I'm si sitting a, a Muslim, uh, person, a, a young Muslim in London and I'm watching ISIS propaganda, um, and what, what, what is it that is inspiring someone like me to all of a sudden buy a ticket, um, like, and go to, and go join groups like this? And, yeah. and, and, and does that, like you said, ISIS is losing a lot of its influence, but I, what is that source of inspiration? Can it be? Can it happen again? Like, can or is this? Uh, in what form can this uh, uh, continue under a different name? The, the first thing I'd say is that um, I would say that there's one thing that pretty much everybody has in common, which is the belief that ISIS, the Caliphate of ISIS, is the one way that that. Sunni Muslims should live. That is, 
under a single caliph who enforces a strict version of Islamic law. They all believe that. Now, pretty much everything else about the path from sitting in front of your computer in London to get to going to Raqqa uh, could go in, in many different directions. I mean, there are some people who on those computers are seeing crushed babies, uh, babies crushed by Bashar al-Assad and, and think, all right, I have to go to Syria because what could be better than to, to give my life to save innocent uh, children? Um, that's one way people went. Um, that's, that was more the attitude in 2000, I say 2013 perhaps. Um, and then there are other people who think, all right, well, Bashar al-Assad, yes, he's bad, but, um, I have to go there because I want to be a good Muslim. And maybe that's because in the past I've been a bad Muslim, or I think I've been a bad Muslim and I'm going to convert to a kind of stronger quote unquote version of Islam which will be reflected in my my committing myself to probably an early death fighting for ISIS. Um, and then there's other people who, who seem to have been pious for, for a long time. And they just think that, yes, I'm going to go fight for the caliph because I have to. Because, look, I've, I've been reading Islamic history, and historically that's kind of the way that Muslims have been expected to live, that is, having given allegiance to a, to a, to a single imam. So... Some of these paths that I've just outlined are, um, shall we say, that they're they're more high-minded, more intellectual than others. But when it comes down to it, they all are committed to to the belief that that Abu Bakr al Baghdadi is the way to go for Muslims. So I think that they all lead to the same place, but they go many many different paths to get there. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people talk about. Uh, I mean, one one of the apologist arguments, and. Uh, I, I guess I want to ask you, to what extent is this true based on your encounters and your conversations with uh, ISIS sympathizers, is that uh, uh, that these are not religious people. Like the ISIS people, they're not really religious, or they just, some of them recently converted, and then, you know, they went there because uh, they were promised money, or they were promised, you know, uh, beautiful wives, or uh, whatever it was, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, um, which I think is the part of when people go and join any kind of group, uh, but this idea that they weren't, they're not really religious, they drink beer, they go to strip clubs and so on. So uh, on, the, on the other hand, you know, people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he's a very well-educated man in Islam, right? So he is, he studied the Quran, he's uh, supposedly even has a graduate degree, a PhD from uh, the Islamic University in Baghdad, um, but uh, they say that the recruits the the minions are, are are sort of ignorant of what Islam is, but have you encountered that, and and to what extent? Uh, so I, I think that that interpretation that the the foot soldiers are are especially dumb or especially not religious um, is wishful thinking. Mm. It's it's just false. Um, now, here's why people think it: they do find that. So and so went there from Birmingham, and his past is as a petty thief, an addict, doing things that historically Muslims have not been allowed to do: um, steal, do drugs. Um, and then they say, "Aha, this person is not religious," and they overlook, I think, often willfully, this conversion that ha has happened. They they say, "All right, because he was not pious in the past, surely his current attitude when he fled to ISIS was." Equally, equally impious. It was, in, it was, he was motivated by wanting to get laid, wanting to be rich and famous. That, that um, seems almost never to be the case. Usually what happens, a, a typical story is someone, yes, was a, uh, was a Muslim who was not especially observant and then who came to a moment of existential curiosity, mm. um, maybe even dread. Um, usually was, it was, had encountered someone who said, look, ISIS, uh, it, it, you've not been a good person. We understand that ISIS is the way out of that impiety that you, and that vice that, that you had embraced in the past. So it's, that, that it's true that they, this person was not quote unquote religious in the past, but going to to ISIS was his act of conversion. It was his act of, of, of moving into a religious direction. Um, mm -hmm. 
The other thing I would say about this accusation that we've just got a bunch of thugs who are not interested in religion at at all. So first of all, they're confusing the duration of their religion with the depth, the profundity of it. Um, the, the, The other thing they're doing is they're setting, I think, often an impossibly high bar for what counts as a religious motivation. So, yeah, it, it would be, I think, weird to, I mean, they'll say, all right, does this person read Arabic? No, he's from Birmingham. Unlikely, even if he's of Arab descent, that he's going to read Arabic. Certainly if he's from uh, of Pakistani or Bangladeshi de- descent, very unlikely. Does he have a, a, a long history of, of studying books of fiqh, of theology? No, he doesn't. Well, yeah, but few people do. I mean, the, the average Muslim, including a, a you know, deeply pious Muslims, they have jobs, they have hobbies, and they don't spend a lot of time in the library reading these books. These are, are, are scholarly books. So if they say the person doesn't have that kind of deep, learned, you know, graduate level education in Islamic sciences, true, but that's a pretty high bar to clear. What I would liken it to is if, if we said about, say, American soldiers, American soldiers, when they join the army, do they say, do we ask them, um, do they really understand patriotism? Have they read the, the, the yeah. Federalist Papers? Um, do they understand constitutional law? You know, huge libraries exist of constitutional law and interpretation. The, the answer is almost none of them do. But are they patriots? Are they, are they in some deep sense Americans? Yes. And I, I think that's the, the, the kind, that's the level of, of um, that's the threshold we should, we should hold ISIS followers to. They too, they know the basics of it, but you, know, you can't expect them to, to, to all be scholars. And if you ask them to, be, to all be scholars before you call them religious, then you've, you've created an artificial and, and frankly ridiculous standard for them. My, sorry, sorry, Armin. Can I can I ask just one one more thing uh, before uh, you go on? I, I wanted to just go back quickly before I forget. You know, you talked about some of the earlier ISIS members who went there because they saw Assad crushing babies, and um, they said, "Well, I want to go there and save the children." So people who went and joined ISIS with that intention, um, and some of them I I know have left Syria. They've been disappointed with what it, it turned out to be. Um, have you encountered any of them or, or talked to them and how do we deal with that? I know there's a controversy here in Canada with, you know, uh, the government saying that they want to sort of rehabilitate people returning uh, from fighting. That uh, It's a complicated issue because they can't confirm that they fought for them or what they did there. But um, I, h- how do you process that? And how, how do you parse sort of the, the sort of different categories of people that may have had different intents when they went there? Yeah. So uh, return, yeah. when, when returnees come back, um, they say a lot of things and, um, I can't see into their souls. So some of them say, Oh, I was never really interested in the caliphate. I, I went there to, to save babies from Bashar al-Assad. That, that may be true for, for a number of them. And if that's the case, then obviously it's going to be a, um, much easier to rehabilitate them and to make sure that they're, they're safe for the general human population of Canada. Um, However, the ones who came after, say, mid-2014, it it really becomes hard to believe that, both because when we actually do censuses and ask questions and, and also look at the writings and so forth of the people who went, we saw that there was a change then. The change was they had got the message about the caliphate. They knew what ISIS was doing. ISIS was working very hard to make sure everybody, including non-Muslims, knew what they were doing. So the fact that they had gotten the pamphlet, they, they'd read the literature, they, um, you know, having flipped through the brochure, they went to ISIS, makes it a lot harder for them to then say, oh, I, I went to ISIS as a humanitarian gesture, which I think a lot of them have, have since tried tried to claim. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's, what this tells us is that uh, you can't always trust people when they when they say something. What you want to do is is what, as a journalist, I've I've tried to do, which is read what they say at the time when they're making these decisions. They're often prolific on social media or talking to friends. 
find out what they say then rather than taking their word for it when they're motivated by a desire to stay out of, out of, out of jail. So mm-hmm. my, my, my understanding is, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the average ISIS member, uh, and again, there's a huge, there's a lot of ex- exceptions to this, and you could always find examples for, any, for almost anything, but the average ISIS member knows their Islam a lot more than an average Muslim in general. Uh, is that, is that your understanding? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we, we can't be too sure of that because yeah. there's no, there's no census of, of general knowledge in, 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 in the, in the world of ISIS. Um, I would just point out this. The average Muslim does not know that much about right. Islam as a scholar. I mean, as you know, the average Muslim, um, does not read Quranic Arabic. Well, that, that'll be quite a, um, quite a setback in trying to claim that you know oh, much about or Arabic about in Islam. general. I mean, the majority of the Muslims in the world are non-Arabic speaking, in, even in general. So, right, and the, yeah. the average, I mean, it, it takes an educated Arab to be able to read Quranic Arabic, so it, it's, a, it's a small minority. Now, w- what we can say, though, is that ISIS followers, uh, just by virtue of imbibing, perhaps at gunpoint, once they get there, the propaganda of the Islamic State means, means that they're exposed to a lot of questions about Islamic theology and law that the average Muslim is not exposed to. So if you're a cab driver in Karachi, then what are the chances that you're going to be um, exposed on any given day to, to questions of, uh, of um, let's say, of, of, of a political nature about the nature of Islam um, and what Islam requires of you? Um, it could happen. But in ISIS, you're told that constantly. That's that's what the that's what the propaganda exists to do is to make sure that you, that's really put into your head the correct answer to, to this this catechism of, of of political and theological questions. So, yeah, it, it wouldn't be too surprising if we found that people who were subject to that and who who were interested in it had a higher level of general knowledge than but- the average working Muslim anywhere else in the world. My, 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 my guess would be that even before they get there or even before they join, the people that decided to join, they knew more about Islam before even they got there compared to the average Muslim. And, and again, that's just a guess. I don't know. But given that we don't have any census on any of this, when you mentioned the average path towards these, how do we know, like, how do we know the, the average path? Is that based on talking to as many of them as possible? Okay. Yeah, so there's enough who have left. We're, we're talking about forty thousand people at this point. Mm-hmm. That the the numbers can be they they the numbers are high enough that we have a sense okay. uh, of what's driving people to go. And it, it it changes different by year and it also by place. Mm-hmm. So if you look at say the Americans and Canadians who went, it's a much stranger, more mixed bag of, of people compared to, say, the French or Russians who went. But yeah, yeah you, you're, you're totally right that even before they get there, they know more about this stuff than most people because, first of all, most people don't know anything about it. Yeah. And then second, because they've turned this into their hobby. I mean, they go crazy over it. They, they'll be reading constantly about right. uh, this or that Wahhabi text, and, and they might not be able to the read it in the original, but they know what the right answers to the big questions are, which is more than you can say for a, for for the average um, believer anywhere. There's a there's a joke that a lot of Muslims mention online that I see a lot. That um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, they say that ISIS was or ISIS or Al Qaeda terrorist group basically was stopping a Christian family, and they wanted to kill them if they're not Muslim, and they asked them to recite the Quran and because they were Christian, the, the father just says part of the Bible and then the ISIS people just let them go um, like, okay, that's fine, go. And then the family says like, why did you tell them the Bible? Like, how did you know it's going to work? Like, oh, they're terrorists. They don't know anything about Islam. And that's a story people made up to say like, oh, actually um, ISIS people don't know much about yeah. it, yeah. But, but it's, fun, it's Islam I mean, for dummies <laughs> thing that they all they've read is Islam for dummies. Was, right. I think that book was actually found in someone's backpack. Or, right. Yeah. There's yeah. there's a very famous case of of some people who they left it, I believe, in their Amazon.co.uk cart. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> and they're ridiculed for this, and you know, yeah. it's fine to ridicule them for this. But what that shows, though, 
is that they were really curious about Islam. That was what the, I'm guessing these people were not really much readers in the past. Right. This is what they wanted to know more about. And I, I know you're telling a joke, Armin, but w- there are also videos of interactions that are not too different from that, that uh, have, have ended differently. Um, there's a, a very famous one where this, uh, this kind of Prince Valiant looking um, ISIS guy named Abu Wahib uh, is asking a bunch of truck drivers about how many how many uh, cycles of bowing that one does in particular prayers, and uh, if they don't get the answers right, then th- mm. then they die. So I um, think I will survive if they capture me. Uh, well, actually, I, don't <laughs> yes, know. I think I'll, a lot I'll, of no, actually, no, 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 no. I would do the. Sh- I don't. I I only know how to do the Shia prayers. I don't know. Actually, never mind. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, you you're, you're not going to survive. No, I'm not going to survive. Shia <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, yeah, but but to 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 clarify though. Uh, to to our audience, um, w- w- they, 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 because I think a lot of ideas our audience might not understand. When Islam for Dummies, the reason why they were being made fun of is like, look, these people are have a book called Islam for Dummies. This shows how much they know, how little they know about Islam. But to me, that seems actually very impressive that they 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 cared about like they're joining ISIS. Are like, I better. I better refresh my Islam stuff. Like to me, it shows how important it, it is for them to know Islam. And I, and I bet you that Islam for Dummies book has more information about Islam in it that the average Muslim knows about Islam. Yeah. The, the dummy series are generally underrated. Yeah. Like I've noticed, like if you actually sit down and read that, they're, they're actually not that bad. They're pretty, they, they give pretty good versions of, uh, you know, any, any topic. Yeah, if, you, if you're if you're ignorant of the topic, then you could do a lot worse than a teach yourself book or a, yeah. a, right. something for dummies. And right. the, the other thing about that, by the way, is we don't even know who they were buying this for. It may not have even been for themselves. It what it illustrates, I think. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Right. It doesn't it doesn't show even that they were were um, novices at this. Um, what it really shows is is that if you find a little thing like that to ridicule then a lot of people will stop looking at the story. They won't look further to find out the question, the answer to the question like, who's it for? Mm. What, you know, why were they reading this book? It's just taken as, aha, there's something we can laugh at. And I'm all in favor of laughing at members of ISIS, but I'm also in favor of doing good journalism. And th- that right. includes asking questions like, what exactly is going on with, with the Islam for Dummies? Who are these people? And finding the, like, the deep answers to what was really motivating them and what is their background. So, um, Graham, I wanted to ask you about uh, one more thing. There, there's a book called, uh, well, actually, a whole bunch of more things, but I guess the next thing is uh, there's a book called The Management of Savage, Savagery, right? Uh, that was written uh, by, say, Abu Bakr Naji, right? It was, uh, yeah. But I think it was a, it's sort of a guide for Al-Qaeda and... and uh, um, if I'm getting this right, it was about uh, sort of weakening uh, the, the 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 people in power in a way that sort of drain their resources and drain their energy and, and make Islam um, dominant that way uh, as a part of jihad. And, and so, is this has this been instrument? Has this been influential? I mean, did, did you know about this? About whether it's been influential in uh, um, with ISIS fighters or or people who are or even Al Qaeda fighters, in the sense, of how significant is it? Because I know it got a lot of press um, a few years ago. Yeah, uh, so there have been reports, uh, especially from I think almost all, maybe even all, originating from a researcher named Hassan Hassan, that this book was actually a textbook used in ISIS training camps, which it may well have been. Um, it's not something that you see um, quoted a lot. Uh, it's not something that the rank and file are obviously exposed to. So I, I think it's possible to overstate how influential it's been, especially for English speakers, though. Uh, the level of its influence, I, I think, has been maybe overestimated because it was translated very ably by Will McCants into English uh, long before ISIS existed. So it's one of the primary source jihadist texts that English speakers can can read. And sure enough, there's a lot in there that, that sounds pretty familiar from the, the ISIS MO. But remember, this is a this is a book that that's uh, I think over 10 years old. Um, and it's 
it's it's one of many texts that ISIS has, has taken on. There's there's other ones about uh, you know the, the jurisprudence of blood is the name of another one that that seems to have been more widely distributed within ISIS territory. But yeah, if, if readers want to see something that is um, kind of like a dumb Clausewitz of jihadism, then yeah, you can you can read the management of savagery. Savagery it's available online, and it will will show yeah. a lot of how ISIS did did what it did. What it did. Yeah, the, there's a, a full and and there's a um, I guess in terms of strategy, one of the differences between Al Qaeda and ISIS has been where whereas Al Qaeda was really about uh, trying to. Um, attack superpowers and weaken superpowers and drain their resources and you know attack the West and then there was some of that motivation. ISIS seems to be more regional in terms of you know building a caliphate. Um, uh, is, is that a is that an important fundamental distinction between the two or uh, is there more overlap? Between um, their- yeah, it's, it's true that in their original fo- focus, uh, you could distinguish by saying Al Qaeda wanted to attack the United States, attack Israel, uh, attack London. Uh, and ISIS wanted to, to keep things local at first. Um, they would say, look, great job, Al-Qaeda. You brought down the Twin Towers. But where did it really get you? You lost the state that was sheltering you. Uh, your leader was assassinated after uh, many years of, 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 of hiding like a rat. So I think we can do better by, by looking locally. But it's not the only distinction. The other things that I think we we, we might want to, to to highlight, distinguishing old school Al Qaeda from ISIS, um, is an emphasis on theology. So Al Qaeda was way more cool with people not quite getting everything right about their their theology. So remember, Al Qaeda's patron uh, sheltering them was a Deobandi Hanafi group called the Taliban. Whereas right. ISIS, ISIS would say, look, Hanafism, um, we want a proper, more like jihadi Salafi group, uh, which the Taliban were not. There are specific things about how one, pr- how one prays, what one thinks about the, uh, the unity of God that they thought the Taliban didn't get right. Um, and ISIS had to be told to chill out by when, when they were answering to Al Qaeda because, the, you know, people like Zarqawi would, right. They'd say, you know, you're you're following some some people who do not have some important things right, and he was told in response, "It's okay, just just forget this stuff for a little while." <laughs> and Zarqawi said, "No, no, we start with getting all of this right. Mm. We start with the ideology. We do not compromise on things like uh, whether we're we're living under a properly constituted Muslim state that applies Sharia, and." That was something that Al Qaeda was willing to let slide. So I, I think yeah. that, I mean, I think that, I, that distinction I remember, is key. Yeah, I remember reading a. I think it was a letter from uh, what was it, um, uh, Zawahiri uh, to Zarqawi. I, I can't yes. remember who wrote it to, but uh, this was some time ago, and this is when Al Qaeda in Iraq, when Zarqawi was kind of on the rise. Um, and uh, Zarqawi wanted to. He was attacking a lot of Shia, a lot of the. Um, you know, minorities within the Muslims who, who he considered her- heretics or apostates. Uh, and uh, so I hear you wanted him to sort of lay off of them. Yeah. And, uh, that was yeah. kind of you got it exactly story. right. Yeah. Exactly right. He, he was saying, uh, look, you're right that the Shia are all screwed up and their, their leaders and scholars deserve to die because they're calling people to, to the hellfire. Um, but Zawahiri said, look, Zarqawi, <laughs> If you do this, people will not understand. Plus, most of these Shia are just ordinary people. They're just dumb. They haven't heard. They don't know any better. And Zarqawi didn't reply, but we know that he kept on killing Shia, so he, he must not have been very persuaded by this. It's 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 yeah. hard for a lot of people to um, hear that uh, Al Qaeda was more easygoing and less extreme than and than another group. And we were talking uh, about Al Qaeda. They were the moderates. <laughs> they yeah. were mo- but uh, I'm I'm gonna try to combine three of my questions into one because I see some live chat, uh, some Patreon questions earlier. We need to get into get to at some point. Uh, but how do you compare uh, Trump's uh, with Obama? Like, what what can we? What did Obama get right? And what can we blame Obama for? It, did Trump get anything right, or and can we blame Trump any, for anything? And especially 
what the two main things that people focus on leaving Iraq was that a disaster leaving Syria is this a disaster is this a good idea so can you compare these two together yeah yeah so I I thought that the Obama strategy um, although Obama said some things that were manifestly untrue about the ideology of ISIS and the motivation of people going to it the general strategy of let's contain let's stop them and then let's slowly degrade was probably the right one. Um, there's something that, you know, it's one of those dogs that didn't bark kind of situations where the worry a few years ago, three or four years ago, was that America was going to go in and we'd have American soldiers in cages being burned alive. Even if we didn't have that, we might have issues of Dabik magazine, the, the official magazine of the Islamic State, that showed Americans killing Muslims, videos of that. Guess what? We, we didn't see that. And yet there were, there's thousands of Americans who are, who have been in Syria, mostly supporting other, other, uh, other groups fighting ISIS. Um, and that is, uh, it's quite a magic trick to, to have American soldiers killing ISIS and yet not have the world see very many images of that. So I, I think that was generally right. What Trump did was to say, well, ISIS is not quite gone yet. We will accelerate this process. And we'll do it mostly by bombing. Now, that I, I think is, um, I'll just say, an extremely costly way to defeat ISIS. Uh, Obama could have done that at any point. He could have pulverized the city of Raqqa. By doing it, what, what Trump did was first deprive ISIS of its capital and a bunch of other cities and shrink it down to a much smaller size. That's good. What's bad about it, though, is that the people who then moved back into their former cities lived in in you know, a, a necropolis. Uh, there's there were no longer cities; they were they were mounds of rubble, um, and many civilians died in that effort. So there's a lot of goodwill lost, um, and the same result I think was achieved. The big worry, of course, with that slow process that Obama was was following was that ISIS was planning to attack elsewhere. It was planning to attack in the United States, Canada, Europe, many different places. And having those safe havens made it easier for them to do that. So what, what we had to carefully calibrate and titrate was figuring it out a way to kill them, to kill them slowly, but in a way that wouldn't allow them to have enough um, maneuverability and inspiration to cause attacks to happen elsewhere. What, what, what Trump did was accelerate that, and I think at, at a cost that was probably too great. But but people might say like, oh yeah, they have when they come back home, a lot of much of it is destroyed. But at least now, because of Trump, they, this devil's advocate, by the way, they have something to come back home to. Like like they wouldn't have been able to come back if ISIS wasn't defeated this way. Yeah. So what I think that that misunderstands, though, is that um, you could ask them, you could ask them, did you prefer living under ISIS or did you prefer living on top of a, a mountain of rubble? And the answer, I think, was mostly we preferred living under ISIS. We didn't like living, living under ISIS, but ISIS um, provided services. It provided something like a reliable rule of law. It was savage. It was not the rule of law that we would choose. But it was not uh, death. It was not anarchy. Um, and that's what ISIS um, said from the beginning. And to go back to the management of savagery, w one of the things that, that is suggested there is you want to increase through your savagery the amount of chaos in a place. Because when ISIS shows up, when you show up to, to clean up that chaos, you're going to show up with a three by five card that says, these are the rules, we're going to follow them. Anybody who doesn't follow them is going to get killed. And people will understand that. What, what, what ISIS brought originally and what allowed it to expand was reliability. It brought through savagery something that looked like order. Um, and like a mob. No, it sorry. was, yeah. yeah yeah, and what? Sorry. So I, I just don't think that that we should um, endanger the, the the credit that we have by replacing ISIS with disorder, which I'm afraid is is but, is is what we've seen. But an American citizen might be might say, like, it seems to me that 
um, going based on what you're saying, going faster is ben beneficial to the people in the United States, but and it's more costly to the people living over there. Um, but we just the main priority that we have is to make sure that they don't have a base to attack us from. And given that the American president is meant to take care of it, its, sit, its own citizens first, we should go with the strategy that achieves that. But isn't that a short term strategy? <laughs> like, yeah. in the long term, doesn't it come and sort of bite you in the ass in a way? Or, yeah, I, I think, Armin, you, you've, you've articulated very well what, what the kind of nativist, nationalist, uh, the strategy of, of of Trump supporters is, which is, look, it's not it's not our problem if people are living on piles of rubble in Raqqa. We're protecting ourselves, and that's what we want our government to do. Now, I would, I I also think, uh, Ali, that, that that is a short term strategy. If you're going to say, look, these people are going to be on top of piles of rubble, but, but they're not going to be uh, attacking us. Well, give it some time. They're they're not going to forget who turned their homes into rubble. Um, I'm not saying that Syrians are are going to flock to Canada or the United States or Europe to to uh, have terrorist attacks because the United States fought against ISIS. But yeah, you know, that's a, in, that's a different. Um, it, it, it's it's just that the reason ISIS was able to grow in the first place was because there was such horrible mismanagement, misgovernment, and barbarity on the part of, of governments in the region. And if that isn't eventually solved, then of course this, this problem is going to come back over and over and over again. So does this, a little, um, again, this is devil's advocate, uh, this might contradict what you were saying earlier, somebody might say, because this sounds like the argument that people make that this is not really about ideology, this is not about Islam. If we just stop bombing them, maybe they wouldn't attack us anymore. This is more about us destroying their cities. Obvious. What do you expect? You think like we could just go bomb them and not expect a reaction? This is all just based on a reaction to the, to our far, to our destructive foreign policy over there. It's, it's, um, and what you're saying basically confirms that. Well, <laughs> no, I, I I disagree with that. <laughs> what I think what I think it shows is that. What you what you need for the the kind of perfect recipe for uh, absolute disaster is not just ideology. It's a place for that ideology to land mm. and for 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 it to to be cultivated, for it to grow, and a place like Syria, where uh, you had uh, especially Sunni and Kurdish areas that uh, were not. Uh, were not respected by uh, they were you know they were preyed upon by the government of Damascus, then it'll pl it'll create a place where where uh, where these ideologies can can take root. What I think that if if anything the the biggest policy discovery from this horrible ISIS misadventure has been is that we thought, especially during the Obama administration, that look they take the city of Raqqa. They live uh, in a horrible place, beset by poverty, uh, surrounded by enemies. They're going to stay over there. It's okay. People will flock there, but we'd much rather ha have someone who kind of likes Al Qaeda living in Raqqa than living in Oslo or living in Ottawa. And mm. I, I don't think it, 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 the story might start that way, but we now know that it doesn't end that way. No, the, it the hope that, that they would just stay over there. Uh, does not look very good in 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 retrospect, and I'm I'm glad to say the Obama administration eventually came around to to realizing that 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 couldn't ever be allowed to happen. But the reason why it ha it was so bad was because you had this political um uh this this, this political problem, this misgovernment, and then it was allowed to combine with the uh, ideology. So any explanation that doesn't contain all of these things mm -hmm. together is going to be insufficient. Yeah, I I think Obama um, read your article. Like I saw, I think there was a picture of him holding the Atlantic magazine. I, I recall seeing it somewhere at the time uh, when, when with the, the one that had uh, what ISIS really wants on the cover. Uh, so I, I hope that <laughs> I hope that helped. It might be, but uh, so I, I wanted to move on to um, you know because we want to get to patent questions. We could. What are you going to Spencer? Armin. Because I have one last question. Well, you, yeah. Okay, before you go to Rich uh, Spencer. Um, 
Uh, We're not, it's not just going to be Spencer. I have another. Okay, but so, go ahead. So go ahead. sorry. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Obama. What about um, what about Trudeau uh, and him bringing back uh, ISIS members? Or their the rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is is the people that are scared of that exaggerating it or not, or is it scary? I mean, I'm here in Canada. Are these ISIS people are now being, coming back to Canada? Should I should I be worried? Uh, no, you shouldn't be worried. Uh, and you shouldn't have been worried e even before um, ISIS was quote unquote defeated. Uh, there's never been a time when ISIS was, was so powerful in Canada that uh, you should have changed one aspect of the, any aspect at all of the way that you, you live in Vancouver or Toronto. So start with, with that baseline. But how about bringing them back and then rehabilitating them? I, I know Trudeau and his government have, have been criticized for um, rehabilitation efforts that, that, you know, I think the, the, the phrase teaching them poetry was one, yeah. of, the, one of the things. And look, it, it's, it's true that having someone, um, you know, being able to just try to talk the person out of it or, um, make them, make them more docile by, by a kind of reeducation, light reeducation, um, uh, is not likely to work. Um, but what you have to also understand is that there is just a there's a wide variety of ways that 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 people um, need to be dealt with. There are some people who they really just went over there because they didn't know better, and they've come back with their tails between their legs. And you you need to 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 deal with that person differently from someone who went over there to fight, learned how to fight, and then is coming back hoping to kill. Um, the whole um, the whole spectrum of returnee needs, needs to be dealt with. I, I, I think that that second um, example that I just gave of, of someone who learned to fight and came back, that's the one we have to worry about. Mm -hmm. that if we were to look at like the, the jihadist attacks in the past, lethality, um, the number killed has been, it's tended to be pretty low, like between one and two per attack. Per attack. It's not very much. Um, they tend to be much, much higher when the person has learned how to use weapons properly uh, and who has come back with the intention of killing. So, of course, we need to, to focus our attention on that type. Now, of course, there's also things like these truck attacks, which, which have, have increased the ability to kill uh, for, you know, idiots who have never left home. But, um, yeah, the, the, the general point is still stands that we need to, to calibrate our reaction very carefully based on um, what people have, what, yeah, what, what kind of background they're bringing. And at least should I, we be, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Armin. No, I had yeah, an please. earlier question that didn't, uh, I think I need to repeat because it, um, leave, Obama leaving Iraq, was that a bad idea? And Trump leaving, is this now a bad idea? Yeah. So Obama leaving Iraq had, had a very predictable effect, which was that the United States had much, much less credibility and uh and maneuverability when they started seeing isis arising so i i know for a fact that nuriel maliki went into the oval office and was told by obama look what's happening it's happening on your border it's happening in your country there is an army that's rising and it will come and attack mosul mm -hmm. uh and he could tell that to maliki but maliki didn't have to do anything about it. And sure enough, he didn't. Mm. So when the United States still had a large presence in Iraq, then Sunni tribes could say, all right, well, we, we, we can still ask the United States to help us out with, to, to fend off um, both Baghdad and uh, Shia backed government and also ISIS. If I, if the United States not there is not there, then the, the Sunni tribes are going to have to say, look, it's, it's ISIS or no one. So we're going to go with ISIS. So yeah, leaving Iraq had predictable weakening effects on American influence in the region. Did they have a choice if, uh, if the country is telling you to leave? Like, can't, United States can't, wouldn't be able to stay if their, their, their government wasn't welcoming them anymore. Right? Yeah, it, you're exactly right. So if, if the government says go, then, to stay, you, you, well, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a, a difficult problem. Of course, Americans arrived in Iraq without being asked to come in the first place, so there is that. Yeah. Um, and then you asked about Trump leaving Syria. Uh, so 
yes, there are three Americans killed and others wounded uh, just a couple days ago in this bomb attack. And yes, uh, yeah, that's right. And in in Mon Beach, Syria, and it's uh, it's predictable. Um, Trump said in December, "We're going to take everyone away, and we're going to do it now." Use the adverb "now," and that's exactly what you wouldn't want to say if if if, if you want to maintain didn't some he say ability. That to, we were it's an invitation. Take, it's an invitation, he, right? Didn't he say yeah. that we're we're not going to do what Obama did and announce what they're about to do? And now he's doing exactly <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you could think, all right, well, we're, we're going to. You say you're going to leave, then the ISIS will just let you leave. No, that's going to cause ISIS to attack you as soon as possible and to to hit you hard because it shows that ISIS was the one that drove you away. It it shows that uh, you know no one's going to want to help the Americans because the Americans aren't going to be a, a, going to be there to 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 watch your back either. It also means that that and I, I think this is probably most important. That, that these armies that, and militias that have been fighting ISIS uh, at great cost uh, can no longer trust us. I mean, there was always some doubt about whether they could. Now they know for sure it was a bad bet on their part, and who knows what's going to happen next. So I, I, I think the manner of the planned American exit uh, is disgraceful. Yeah. So I, so I, I have to ask you this. I wasn't planning to, uh, but. Um, it just came up from you know this discussion is that you know there's this idea that you know if the U.S. had never gone into Iraq, then ISIS would have never appeared. Um, but there was this element of the Arab Spring, right? So there were people who were rising up. You know, Mubarak came down, uh, Gaddafi came down, and then there was this resistance against Assad. So uh, if we do a sort of revised theoretical version of uh, history and supposing Saddam had not been removed from power, then uh, there may have been an uprising against Saddam as well, just like there was against the other dictators. He would have clamped down on it, and wouldn't ISIS have arisen anyway? I, I mean, I, I guess that's not a question to answer. It's more just an idea that I, I, I don't know, to what extent can we go back and say if this hadn't happened, then maybe hmm. the result would be different. I don't think we can say that at all. Yeah. No, you're right to bring in the Arab Spring as uh, I mean, none of these things is decisive. And, and of course, there's going to be a lot of people who want to relitigate the 2003 questions about whether to invade or not by saying ISIS wouldn't have been around if that were the case. Well, uh, Saddam Hussein would have been probably dead by 2018, mm -hmm. actuarially. And, uh, you know, Kose and Uday Hussein would have been perhaps running the country or perhaps it would have collapsed under its own weight. Uh, anyway, yeah, who knows? So to tell, yeah. There's so many ways in which Iraq could have gone sour um, that, you know, ISIS is definitely not a, a, a favorable result, but there's no way we compare, can compare it to, to yeah. the alternate histories. But, okay, so uh, so that's, but, 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 sorry, Armin, I'm, I'm going to... Huh? No, no, Go but just, just to give credit to what you're saying, <laughs> Ali, the stuff that started ISIS was war and movement before the Iraq invasion. That's what, it, that's what we could say, at least for sure. Like, yes, so yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's true. And, and you know... It, like people like to point out that Abu Bakr al Baghdadi was uh, radicalized or was able to radicalize others in Camp Bukka. True. This is true. Um, Camp Bukka being one of the internment camps that yeah. became a quote unquote academy for jihadists uh, in the and, mid 2000s. And he did it very quietly too. Apparently, he was a very sort of shy, quiet guy. And uh, from what I read about it when he was in the camp, but yeah, he had quiet he was very charisma. What, yeah. what what we know for certain, though, is that he was already a jihadist when he went in. He was already a jihadist by the time the United States invaded. So it's it's not as if uh, the leadership of, of ISIS was radicalized by America. They were radicalized long before that. And it's true that Saddam Hussein uh, was in with with one hand encouraging them and the other hand holding them back so um it, mm -hmm. the united states uh for one reason or another another decided to inherit a really big problem that that had had been um you know partially cultivated by by saddam yeah so i i wanted to move on to uh this thing so you you wrote another article in uh, the atlantic 
you know, called His Kampf, and that was uh, about Richard Spencer, who's the you know the notorious white supremacist, um, and apparently sort of very influential, at least online. Uh, white supremacist. He coined the term alt right, and and y- you went to high school with him. And uh, but what I got from the article was that it, he's, he was kind of unremarkable then. And then years later, you meet him, and you end up having a conversation with him. Um, and so I'll, I'll just highlight one of the things about it that was interesting, where he told you that he really liked your article, "What ISIS Really Wants," and he said that it was very popular uh, in alt right circles, and that made you wince. So uh, <laughs> can you sort of discuss that? Because that's something that kind of happens to us too sometimes. Yeah, so yeah, I, exactly. he said, oh, we, we, on the alt-right, our, our racist chat groups, we really liked what ISIS really wants. And no one wants to get praised by Richard Spencer for any reason. So I, I did wince, but I asked, all right, well, why is that? And what I expected was they were going to say, Oh, you know, we really hate Muslims, and your article showed that that Islam is really bad, uh, which it did not. Any close reader of the article would 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 see something different from that interpretation. And it turns out Richard Spencer is a close reader. Um, he knew that too. What he said he and his his followers liked about it was that it was it was showing an identity movement, which is what they were trying to create. Uh, quietly. They were trying to radicalize people much as they thought ISIS was into a Sunni identity movement. So they said they were comparing themselves um, <laughs> unbidden to ISIS and saying, what? yeah, we, we, we see we see this kind of working out for them and we want to try to, to do something similar. Wait, so what they liked about it people. is that, oh, we want what ISIS is having? Is that like... Yeah, they said, look, I, ISIS was nowhere ISIS was a, a bunch of yahoos out in the desert a few years ago, and they started. ISIS started noticing that they believed something that was important, and they started awakening the consciousness of Muslims around the world, Sunni Muslims around the world. And we want to do the same thing. We, <laughs> ISIS did it right. We want to do it, but for white people. Right now, we've got... You know, we've got Republicans who are in favor of low taxes or whatever. Um, but no, there is a shared European culture that runs through the United States, through Canada, through the UK, through all the way to Poland and Russia. And we want to awaken that. And we saw through your article how ISIS did that. Good on them. You know, this, I, I, this is actually very consistent. Well, not this is, I didn't know this. I mean, this is the exact opposite of what people expect. Like, oh, do you think all tribe would be like, yes, ISIS bad, Muslims, because all Muslims bad, but you're saying like, oh, no, this is pretty cool. We want what those Muslims are doing. But this is a little bit similar because I'm, I, I listen to ex- all extremes. I listen to the extreme left, the extreme right. And a lot of the narrative that I see from the alt right is that the Muslims get it. The Muslims understand the value of family. They understand the value of, uh, you know, m- making sure that your, your people don't die, having children, um, the, 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 the structure of taking care of your own people, uh, making sure that you come, your people come off as strong. And they see it not a lot of not their 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 followers don't see it like that. They're, most of their followers are like, oh yeah, Muslim evil, Muslim bad, Muslim barbaric. But their their leader seems to see it as a enemy that they that they that they you know um, admire, right? Like they see them as an enemy, but an enemy that they that they admire and and they see them as a worthy enemy and an enemy that understands what it's doing. I don't think Richard Spencer and his followers spend that much time admiring Muslims, but I I, I will say this, it, that you will often find them pointing to groups that you think would be their natural enemies right. and then saying, we want to do what they do. So Richard Spencer frequently will quote or quoted when people were listening to him a bit more, uh, Theodore Herzl, the founder of, of the, the so Jewish think, yeah. state of Israel. Yeah, so yeah. he'd say, you know, if you will it, it is no dream we can create a homeland for our people the jews did it right we want to do that right um this does not in any way exculpate him or others from the charge of anti-semitism but it 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 shows 
roughly how they're thinking and right. uh, yeah. uh, what the final dream is. I, I think a lot of times is that what they want to do is uh, when they see something that grows so fast and so tight and it's got the, the, the devotees are, are just um, but they're, I guess, so devoted and so so dedicated to the cause. Um, there's a, a learning element there, and I, I see that now with you know with you know Trump. You know, Trump has this base that no matter what he does, he can get away with. It. He can do a million things, the kind of things where even one of these scandals would have sunk any other president. You know, whether it's Democratic or Republican. Uh, but uh, and and there are there are Democrats who are looking at it They're like, okay, what is he doing? Should we? find somebody who can do the same kind of thing. You know, they're looking at the same kind of strategy because that, that sort of devotion that he has, a cult-like following uh, with his base is, is something that they want as well, even if they absolutely despise him. So, so, so. so, so to, to be clear, I wasn't suggesting that they, they don't hate these groups. I, I, so they, they do still yeah. see Muslims and Jews as their enemies. But what I, what I think, they're seeing is that the white race is losing, they're winning. And the reason why the Jews and the Muslims are winning and the white people are losing is because the Jews uh, and the Muslims have been very effective at uh, taking away the winning elements that, uh, again, this is their narrative. I've, I've just listened to them. The, 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 the cards, that, the winning cards that they have is, is being st stealing they're stealing it from the from the white people which is uh, with with feminism with uh porn i don't know they they obsess about porn uh, uh, with, with 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 trying to reduce the importance of race as an as something to be proud of all these things that is jews and muslims understand as important they mm -hmm. are convincing white people that they're not so important, and that's why the white people are losing, and the Jews and Muslims are winning. Yeah, I, I, I think too. One of the things this illustrates for the the really historical mind, historically minded, is uh, how much of a classic Nazi um, some of these alt writers, including Spencer, are. Um, if you look at how Hitler, for example, talked about other groups. Um, he didn't say everybody should be extinguished. He didn't say everybody has to be killed. He didn't say there should be no more Muslims. We should populate the earth with Germans. Instead, he said more like, I mean, he, he if you read Tim Snyder's work, a historian at, at, at Yale, you, you, you'll, you'll find that he spoke of things in a biological way. This was the early days of, of understanding of ecology. He, he spoke almost a, of, uh, of niches in an ecological system where there's a niche for Muslims, there's a niche for black people, there's a niche for Germans. And the G niche for Germans should be expanded with, with, um, into you know, larger amounts of living space in the Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, of course, he said that there's one group that does have no niche. It, it, all it does is... is latch on Jews, like a yeah. remora and that's the Jews. <laughs> so, um, but I think Spencer is, is much the same way where he, mm. he, th he thinks he's not trying to kill all black people, but he does think th that groups need to live in their own places. And that's, that's a as classically is, Nazi it, as it can get. Uh, yeah. But is it, so is white nationalism because you know, a lot of these, I have actually watched a lot of uh, Richard Spencer because I've wanted to understand his uh, appeal. And I've noticed that uh, he is very watchable. You know, what I want to do is he's, uh, I, I'm not obviously not defending him in any way, but <laughs> he is, uh, he's charming. He smiles, he's presentable. And there are, you know, it, there's a sort of, it's really strange, the illusion that this is like a serious conversation and people asking serious questions. It's very interesting to watch. But um, he's, is there a difference between white nationalism, white supremacy, and then, you know, going into uh, you know, whether he, he's a Nazi or not? Because, you know, I, I know they have terms like race realism and identitarianism that are just sort of, uh, they're no different than white supremacy. But they insist that there is a difference between white nationalism, which is essentially a segregation of, you know, we were okay with you, just stay away from us, uh, versus white supremacy. And I, I feel like I, I don't think that's much of a distinction. There, like, what, there what do you is, think about that? There is. But let, let's, yeah, <laughs> I just want to know what Graham thinks. Yeah, I, so I, I, I would call 
Richard both a white nationalist and a white supremacist. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think he does believe that that uh, white people are biologically and culturally better than others, and that's what white supremacy is. Um, now, that said, if he wants to make a distinction and say, look, there's a difference here, uh, that there is uh, a desire for a white nation that I have, uh, but we could distinguish that from believing that whites are supreme. I could see a distinction being made. I, I think he happens to be both of those, but of these groups have always wanted to to cut the the the, uh, the the labels very very finely. Now, where this gets complicated though is that the labels are often used um, by their enemies, especially as terms of abuse. And right. um, understandably so. Um, so they say, aha, you're a white nationalist, point a finger at him. And then he says, all right, well, I, w- I want to be very clear what a white nationalist is and what a white supremacist is. And nobody cares at that point what these distinctions are. But the fact that that group itself does care and can can make the distinctions, I don't care what the words are that they use. I want to find out what they, what they actually believe. Right. Um, so... The the fact that the the words are thrown around as terms of abuse makes it a lot harder to to use the analytic portions of our mind and figure out what, what they really believe and where these ideas came from, which I I think is far more important than whether we um you know start by we don't want to start by disapproving of them just by pointing the finger and using a a, 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 oh, yeah. a, a nasty word. So the, I agree with I th- that. I yeah. think the, the 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 fact that people don't understand the differences between this is the reason why so many people got confused for why so many white nationalists loved Black Panther. Uh, <laughs> because they were like, why are all these white nationalists enjoying this movie and pointing at it as a good movie, given that every everybody in it is black? But but if if you listen to the narratives, what what Wakanda was is exactly what they were like, like this is what we want this ex- what exactly what they're demanding they want Africa for Africans and we want Europe for Caucasians we we don't see it as something bad we actually admire what they what they want yeah and a lot of people were so confused for why that that was they were they were pointing but they 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 were actually getting ready for for all these white nationalists to be like uh, attacking the movie but they, but they got the opposite reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know about that reaction, but I'm I'm totally no, there was there was still pl- plenty of white nationalists to attack the movie on it though it wasn't well, like the way that, the, yeah. I mean I really do listen to their a lot of their sources I mean the, uh, most of the you know and they get their cues from a certain group of people and I think that was again I'm not talking about white supremacists I'm talking about white nationalists a lot of the white nationalists try to say and I understand there's an overlap between them, that there's a lot of people that are both white nationalists and white supremacists. But there are some, many white nationalists that tr- try to se- say that we're not white supremacists. We just think every race should have its own region. And if, if I can try to seamlessly connect these two discussions too, what we're seeing is something similar to the, the, the process of understanding that there's a new generation of jihadists. With, with jihadism, there was a kind of general understanding. It took a while to come of, of like who the nine eleven hijackers were and what they wanted. And when we tried to, to understand and apply that to ISIS, uh, we were really surprised because it turned out that it was some kid from, from Brixton who decided to go. And that person seemed to be pretty different from a Saudi billionaire. Similarly with the white nationalists and the alt right today, we, we want to think of them as the guy in, at the Klan rally. We want to think of them as some thug from, from you know, who's barefoot and illiterate in a southern state who, who longs for the antebellum South. Actually, the alt right, it's a, it's a, it's a different group that, that, um, is really going to surprise you if you're expecting to, to see the, the anti Semites and racists of, of yesteryear. They look different, and you have to understand them accurately in, in with with a clear picture that that doesn't owe too much to to the uh, you know the old software that's in our mind from from the nineteen fifties. I think a lot of people confuse uh, uh, explaining something with excusing it. Like when you when you spend time trying to explain why somebody is uh, became extreme in their views and they have some radical views. 
people people think like you're you're trying to justify it in some way. But if you, I mean, I don't understand how could you fight anything without actually understanding where it came from. Yeah, one of the one very common objection to the type of reporting that I do uh, is that you're just giving ISIS airtime. Uh, you, you're rewarding them with uh, with with pages in your magazine, and I reject that criticism outright. I I, I think it comes from from. Uh, usually very well-intentioned people who don't understand what journalism is. Right. I mean, what, what I do uh, involves talking to lots of people and I speak to people I approve of. I speak to people I disapprove of. Um, I try to find out though, where the gaps in my knowledge and my reader's knowledge are. And I try to fill them. And sometimes that means looking at people who, who disgust us and deserve our disgust, but we got to look at them. Right. Yeah, you got to. Do, do you get accused of that, uh, the, like of, of humanizing them, of uh, being sympathetic to jihadists, or being, you know, uh, like, you know, so because you know you're a a non-Muslim person or a non-brown person who's criticizing uh, or talking about how ISIS is very Islamic. Uh, this is usually something that when people, even even people like us, do it, we get thrown in. You, you guys are just with the Trump crowd, and you're this and that. But um, you've managed to, I, and I, I do think it's because I mean, yeah, I think you're a fantastic journalist. Uh, but um, you've managed to actually bring this uh, narrative and talk about it very honestly in liberal circles, even, and uh, gotten a lot of legitimacy and uh, had gotten a serious audience because uh, of it. So. What, what is it that you think, I guess, more liberals who want to talk about this honestly uh, can can do? Um, that's very kind of you, first of all. But, I mean, what what they have to do is try to figure out what their biases are and then correct for them. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's a quasi-scientific process of trying to see, all right, well, you know, I expected Richard Spencer not to be so well-spoken. I expected him not to have a graduate degree from the University of Chicago. Well... Okay, if, if that's what you're coming in with, then you might start examining exactly those dissonances and inconsistencies, um, and trying to figure out what, what what that means. You have to 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 update in your mind. Um, that's for me as a journalist. That's one of the ways that I find out uh, find my stories is I notice something that is different from what I expected. Then I ask, why is that so? Um, and usually that's the best way to, to discover that there's a story there. And, you know, in the case of ISIS, it, it was, huh, you know, I was expecting old school Al Qaeda, but they're doing something different. What are they yeah. doing different? And then that brings you to the, the, yeah. the larger questions of ISIS. Same thing with so, Richard Spencer. But going yeah, back so, to so Ali's, question, Ali's question, I want to repeat your question. Like, do mm -hmm. you get accused of like, you're, um, like by Muslims or anybody else, like you're a white man, don't tell me what Islam is about. Do you get accused of that at all? <laughs> well, I'm not a white man anyway, but uh, I, I, I but do people, get accused yeah. all, not all the time. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm generally not, uh, I mean, maybe people don't, uh, maybe people say, but not to my face, that I'm not brown enough to talk about Islam. But, yeah. you know, it, most Muslims who I, I know, um, especially privately, there is some taboo against talking about the dirty laundry of, of the Ummah um, in public. Most Muslims I know are, are, are happy to hear about the distinctions to be made, uh, not just between jihadist groups, but jihadists and non-jihadist Muslims. So it's, I, I like to think that it's a service that, that, that some of my writing has provided to, to show what those differences are and where they came from. I um, of course, there's some people, of course, who will, will never be satisfied and i can't do anything about that but but you're you're that's my experience as well that it's not usually uh the muslims that tell you not to talk about something because of your race it's mostly self-censorship like a lot of people come to me come to us and say and ali had the same experience as well that hey i'm a white man i'm not or i don't have a muslim background so i agree with what you're saying but i don't want to say any of that because i don't think it's my place as if like you have to check your skin color before you actually can talk about something. So that's a huge problem that we try to deal with. Like I, we think it's a form of racism self, you know, I don't know. Um, but, but, but it I, is, if, if you're being, is. if you're being excluded because of, of your race or your skin color, that sounds like racism to me. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it, look, it, it, for, for my part, I mean, my racial background is 
my father is white. My, my mother is of Chinese background. So I think it probably helped somewhat for, um, there is no stereotype about how half Chinese, half white Canadian Americans uh, talk about Islam. Right. So it might have been more yeah. difficult if I were some white Presbyterian, um, but it turns out I'm not. So <laughs> it was helpful to be able to step step between those expectations. Yeah. So, uh, the Graham, you've been really, really generous with your time, and uh, we're just resisting the temptation to have you on for <laughs> but much longer. Least, but patron, it's been fun. Patron questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so okay. I'm getting to patron questions, so we're just going to uh, kind of... Um, we have some patrons through. who are watching this live, so we're going to go through it. Uh, actually, some of what's being asked, uh, I think we've discussed already, so I'll just read them anyway in case you have anything to add. Um, uh, Muscal, uh, well, one of our, I mean, that's a, a, a pseudonym. She's actually, uh, from what I know, she's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Shane Graham, do you think ISIS can be defeated by war alone? Do you think the good people of society need to help them think differently about the world and humanity? I'll, I'll just be quick with this one. Uh, they could be defeated, defeated by war alone. They, they could just be, you could turn the desert into a sheet of glass with a nuclear strike. All the ways to defeat them through war alone, I, I think, w w would would be uh, evil and inhumane. Um, I think what we need to do is, is um, both defeat them militarily and have honest uh, engagement with, with them and their sources. Um, that's a generations-long process, so I'm glad to see it started. And that's that's what this podcast is for, so become a patron if you're not already. So yeah. <laughs> just shameless, shameless yeah. pop, plug right there. Go on, Ellie. Yeah. Jim King is uh, asking, so, you know, we talked earlier about the, uh, the, the ISIS recruits who had the Islam for Dummies books uh, in their, in their uh, Amazon carts. So he's saying roughly what percentage of ISIS recruits are the type who had books like Islam for Dummies, uh, people who lost and who were looking for camaraderie versus actual religions versus uh, just masochistic people. Or I think he's saying, yeah, people who are looking for camaraderie or group belonging versus people who are really religious versus just masochistic people. Can you put sort of percentages on that at all? Uh, no, and mostly just because these categories overlap. Um, there are people who are very religious and who are looking for belonging and who are looking for meaning and who are masochists or, or excuse me, sadists. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's impossible to, to, to finally split that way. Um, but as I said earlier, um, there are many different types of people who, who went to ISIS. They all believed, as far as we can tell, all believed that there was virtue in in um, in fighting under one Muslim banner and living in a in a society where Sharia was implemented in in, in that way. So even the sadists. Mm, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, Tully is saying uh, when we were talking about the returning uh, foreign fighters, uh, he's saying a lot of people predicted these waves of foreign fighters returning home to run operations after the defeat of ISIS. Why hasn't this happened, or is it too soon to tell? That's a great question. Um, so I would say, first of all, um, we don't know where a lot of these people are. Uh, 40,000 people went. The number who have been recorded as returnees is much, much smaller than that. Uh, in other wars that have involved mass migrations of fighters, uh, we've seen mortality rates 20% maybe 30% in Chechnya. So you can expect maybe that number to have died. Maybe many more than that have died in the case of ISIS. But we don't know. We, we just don't know. There's a lot of bones in the desert there uh, that will never be identified. Now, when people return, um, uh, there have been many cases of returnees who have just tried to melt back into society. Uh, I, I went to a German town that ha had a lot of people go to fight for ISIS. And one person had come back. I asked the authorities where he was, and they said, they said like, he's cooking French fries at a Burger King. And what? do you do you really want to wake that guy up and ask, oh, did, you know, don't you think ISIS was the right right way to go? No, just <laughs> let him cook the fries. It's much, much safer to do that. So, yeah. you you know, we we think of conversion to the ISIS way of life as a permanent thing. Um, for some people, it, it led them to their death. And there are going to be some people who say, eh, that was, was, was a bad idea. It was fun while it lasted. <laughs> and 
we got to hope that there's a lot of those. The, by the way, one of the things that 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 is is good news about some of these returnees is that um, there's a lot who get tired, and in time, one thing they all do is get old. Uh, this is the kind of of crazy adventure that one goes on uh, as a young person, and we can hope that that will that will that that a lot of them will age out of it. Not to say that there haven't been some some really old and deadly people who have who have gone, but um, if we can have some of those people cooking fries for a few years, they'll be less dangerous oh, yeah. at, at the end of that. I just had There's an a, ISIS uh, phase. I just grew out of it. Like, yeah, remember we had we went through that ISIS thing. Just, but uh, some people, had, some people would hate hearing this. Some people were like, "Why, why are we not killing them? Like, we need to go find these people. Like, there's no excuse for uh, somebody that was part of ISIS now to just be able to be able to live their lives and cook fries and be free." Something. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of agree with that. I mean, if you can find them while they're still beheading someone or about to, then yeah, you have an obligation to stop them uh, using lethal force. No, even force. if they're not, if, like they're saying like, how is this guy free, living a free life, even just joining ISIS? And even if you're not killing anybody anymore, you joined ISIS. That's it. You can't be free ever, ever again. Yeah, and I, I do think that that people in in general deserve to 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 answer for that that kind of support. Mm -hmm. But look, and this doesn't just pertain to ISIS. If someone commits a crime when he's twenty years old, by the time he's fifty, he's a different person. And in some places, like like Scandinavia, that's reflected in the laws. You can be put away even if you're under sparing Breivik for twenty one years tops. Well, uh, it's like that in Canada too. I mean, twenty-five year a life sentence is twenty-five years here, and uh, uh, the crime rates have not. I mean, uh, it's it it works. It works here. You know? Yeah, there are exceptions, of course, rarely, but uh, it's it is it in the end, it's just a deep philosophical question. Right. How, what kind of of penalty is worth uh, worth punishing someone? And for that matter, if someone went over there and didn't do anything and then came back. I'm sure their intentions w were, in most cases, just as bad as the one who went over there and then beheaded seven Alois. But if they didn't do it, then um, you know they had the same intent, the same mental state. Um, but we don't punish them. But it's just like we don't punish a drunk driver who 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 doesn't kill anyone for manslaughter. We, mm -hmm. we it, it's yeah. Sometimes you're lucky that way. Moral yeah. luck is is reflected in our legal codes. We had uh, a, a previous guest on this podcast was uh, Omar Al Qadra. He's a um, he's from Jordan, so he's a, he he runs a group there called Jor Jordanian Atheists, and and he used to be an Islamist as well. <clears throat> and I, I remember, I, I think it was him who told me that uh, I said, "Well, how did you get so?" Because he he was at one point. I think on the border of joining ISIS, and he even, I think, convinced some people to, later on, he convinced people not to join. So he was very close to this whole situation. And uh, I asked him, and he said that it's it's just a euphoria when you first learn about something new. Mm. And he's like, and if you look at a lot of new atheists or a lot of ex-Muslims, the first time they learned about you know new atheism, they, they were just online watching every video they could find and just delving into it and having all these online discussions and creating communities. He's like, that's exactly what it's like when you first discover that religious fervor. Yeah, um, and, and that's uh, that's one thing that I, I've tried to get people to understand is that ISIS is uh, not unique. Um, we could name zillions of, of previous movements that, that have really captured people's imagination, right. captured their souls, and ended their lives prematurely. Um, Spanish Civil War, um, Children's Crusade, um, Jonestown. These are all movements that 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 made people just as excited as 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 ISIS did. Or bigger ones um, like the French or uh, Russian revolutions. All of those. The Islamic Republic of yeah. of Iran. It, it, there were people who who I mean, we we don't usually think of it because it's been such a routinized revolution since then. But as as you know, there were people who thought. That uh, the Mahdi would come out of occultation as as soon as oh, yeah. Khomeini returned. Some, Some of them Khomeini. thought it was Khomeini. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They thought it was him, and so, he never he he never denied it. Yeah, he never denied or, it. Yeah. So I mean, I I, I like to compare it to you know, you'll find aging hippies who um, 
they don't like to tell their grandkids nowadays that they thought the world might end and, and that their decision to go live on a commune in very rural British Columbia was, uh, you know, they, 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 they thought that they were saving civilization by doing that. And now they went back and they got their dental degrees or whatever, and they lived a normal life. Um, they still, though, think of that moment fondly. They thought, all right, that I really had meaning in my life then. It was awesome what we were doing. Um, I think a lot of the, the people who especially were passive supporters of ISIS thought ISIS was cool, um, whether or not they went or not. They will, if they are still alive and haven't been made to, to pay enormous prices for their, for their support in 20, 30 years, they'll be thinking of it the same way where, you know, it turned out I was wrong about ISIS, but man, Final that memories. made me feel different. And it was, it was kind of yeah. cool, kind of cool. Hmm. So, uh, Sean is asking, uh, he's asking about, uh, Tulsi Gabbard is a 2020, um, candidate, presidential candidate. Uh, she argues that the U.S.-led intervention in Syria is gravely misguided and greatly benefits ISIS. Uh, does uh, did you have any thoughts on Tulsi and her personal trip to Syria? Uh, I, I think that's nonsense. Um, you know, there's an argument that could be made. I don't make it myself. That uh, the American intervention in Syria uh, prolonged what would have been a short civil war, uh, and that if we weren't willing to go in and then follow it to its conclusion, which would have been the, the, the end of the Assad regime, then we shouldn't have done it in the first place. That, one could make that argument. Tulsi Gabbard makes that argument. But the idea that this is, is, has been beneficial to, to ISIS uh, is, 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 is without basis. The Assad regime was um, pretty happy to have something like ISIS around as an, as an alternative and to say, Look, ISIS is, is what you get if you don't get if you don't have us, uh, and I I I think that that um, yeah, Tulsi Gabbard's positions on foreign he, policy in particular are yeah. um, are bad. He freed people from prison for the same for the exact same reason, right? So to have people to have to fight against. Yes, yeah. that that that's been a. I mean, it's not the first not the first dictator to do this. Right. He, mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, there have been many fighters for Assad who have been killed by ISIS. So this is complex, right. but there have, like, if you looked at the siege of Aleppo, there's a look at a map of how Aleppo was being encircled by Assad forces. Well, part of that, that, uh, that siege, one arc of that siege was, um, uh, effectively ISIS. Hmm. So you can see time and time again that while there are times when ISIS is is killing Assad's soldiers there are times when they are uh, working effectively in concert so yeah, um, yeah the, 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 the view that Assad um, is just um, the view of Assad that Tulsi Gabbard seems to have I think it, it is um, factually and, and morally uh, erroneous mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, uh, Michael is asking, uh, and I, th I think we discussed this already, but if you have anything to add to it, he said, what would you be your answer to people like Daniel Hakikachu or Russell Brand who say that ISIS is basically a result of colonialism and Western money? Um, well, he's also got a winky emoticon there, so I think he knows the answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, w yeah. Western colonialism. So, I ISIS is... Um, ISIS is from such a deep place in 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 Islamic history um, that uh, you'd have to explain how why and why it existed even before colonialism was a thing. I mean, what when the Wahhabis were uh, were subduing what's now uh, Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, why were they doing that then? Was it because of colonialism? Um, how about groups like the 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 Kharijites? Uh, this sect in very early Islam that was doing a lot of ISIS-like things and since has, of course, been repudiated by almost all Muslims. But look, these things were in existence long before there was any colonial inter intervention, long before there was an Iraq war. So to say that, oh, it has nothing to do with, with 
um, traditions that that are, are native to Islam, and are, it's just the the errors of of of, of European powers, is a classic error of just attributing too much power to to um, European colonial powers and to Americans too. Americans think that they're responsible for the fate of the world, but that's not the case. It's not true when the Americans think it, and it's not true when when uh, non-Americans think it. The Kharijites actually uh-huh. are something a lot of Muslims use to say that these are the terrorists today, to just say they're neither Sunni or Shia, these are the same as the Kharijites, just to try to take freedom from Islam. Uh, but I think the terrorists themselves, they don't see themselves as Kharijites, they see themselves as Sunni Muslims. Or just Muslims. Yeah, yeah, there's not many people who think of themselves as Karajites. I mean, yeah, okay. there's, there's, I mean, Ibadis think of themselves as as Karajites, I believe. But right. um, look, the the Karajites, um, they were uh, extremely strict, um, warlike sect that would make takfir of other Muslims and fact killed. Um, you know, major figures in Islamic history, uh, who, who so th- th- they're uh, archetypal bad guys. That said, um, there are some ways in which they they uh, look like guardians of a particular kind of literalist Islamic tradition. When the when ISIS was accused of being Harajites, they put up, put out many lengthy and. Um, well considered responses hmm. saying, if we're Kharajites, why don't we do the following things? Hmm. Um, and I've never heard a point by point rebuttal to those to those to those accusations. Interesting. I, I, I think people should look more carefully at, at that accusation. It's 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 yet another hmm. term of abuse rather than an analytic term. My own view, by the way, Kharajites, they're a historic sect from from a thousand years ago. So I don't think that the way that you decide whether ISIS is good or bad is by comparing them to historic sects from a thousand years ago. You, 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 you compare them to, 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 you know, versions of morality that, that uh, I, yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. pertain to all humans and that, that don't, uh, you know, don't, don't find as their basis this, it, it's not how you litigate these moral questions. You just, you, yeah. just, you just described the problem with religion as a whole just by doing that. Yeah. But go on, Ellie. Yeah. So I, we're just going to take a couple more really quick ones. Um, uh, Moose is, is also asking, and I mistakenly said that she was from Saudi Arabia. I got her mixed up with another commenter, so right. apologies for that. Uh, but she's saying, uh, Graham, um, yeah, what is uh, Richard Spencer really like as a person? Well, he, he's not what you expect him to be like if you think that he's going to be um, screaming at you because of your race or... Um, mean i mean he he uh he's a grown up he, he's well educated he's someone who i think any person who, who's interested in philosophy or, or especially western culture could have theoretically a pleasant conversation with um and the fact that people think that he's going to be a, a raving lunatic uh spouting the n word um really puts them off guard and at a loss when they when they meet him so What's he like? Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's a person w- with deplorable ideas, who uh, I would would happily uh, have a pleasant conversation with tomorrow. Hmm. That's I've noticed that about a lot of people with uh, who I think have deplorable ideas. I mean, you um, or even people who I just vehemently disagree with, and I you know it, it's just you meet them and you hear other people say this too. It's like yeah, he's uh, don't agree, but he's got he's such a nice guy. You know that that kind of thing. Um, no, I, I don't give him too much credit for being no. Nice. I, I mean, yeah, I say he's nice guy, but. like he's nicer than you'd think he's going to be. Yeah, um, but how could you be less nice than you yeah. think that a, a person yeah, like him is going to be? Benefit from a low bar, I guess, of expectations. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard to become a leader of a movement without some level of charm and charisma. I guess exactly. Right. Yeah, but go on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, a, a final question, Graham. Uh, thank you for coming. And I think this is a good way to um, uh, to wrap this up. Uh, this is a question from uh, Twitter. Uh, what are you focusing on for your next book? Um, he's uh, this is a economy. Uh, he's saying, what are you focusing on for your next book? Uh, he says, will he promise? Will you promise to narrate all future audiobooks of his? Uh, he thinks that you did an amazing <laughs> job. 
Um, how many languages do you speak? I guess it's not just one question. <laughs> and then he's complimenting you on the Spencer article. But uh, so, yeah, what, what are, are you writing another book? Are you, are you planning another one? What do you want to focus on? And where can yeah, people we'll, find you? I follow you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my website is gcaw.net. And I write mostly for the Atlantic. So if you read the Atlantic, you'll, you'll read my stuff. Um, my next book, uh, I don't have anything to announce yet, but there will be another book. Uh, and it will. Uh, not necessarily exclusively be on on Islamic State or or jihadism. Um, whether I will narrow, narrate it, it's up to the publisher. When the publisher uh, asked me, "Who do you want to narrate it?" they they gave me a form, and I, I think it even said on the form, "You can't say James Earl Jones." So uh, <laughs> I, I said, "I think I could I could probably do it. My voice is is not especially mellifluous, but I do know how to pronounce all the words correctly." So. I was happy to do it for, for myself. Um, one reason I could pronounce all the words correctly is A, because I wrote the book, and B, because as this questioner uh, alluded to, I'm a big language nerd. I love languages. Um, there are at least uh, half a dozen that, are, that, are, that appear in, in, in my book, The Way of the Strangers, um, reflecting the cosmopolitan internationalism of, of, of the Islamic State. Um, I don't have a number on how many languages I speak, but, but I, I've, I've dabbled in a, in a bunch of them. Consider, so, so. consider self-publishing mm. it. <laughs> no, I mean, you already have a lot of people that want publishers is because they want, because it, it comes with some level of, I don't know, prestige, but you already have that. And I think you already have the audience and people know you to come and get the book. I mean, self-publishing is not that difficult. You could really get an editor and a cover design and keep yeah. all the rights to yourself. So Arm Armin's been convincing me to do that too. He's a big proponent of uh, self-publishing. And, and he's got he's got very good arguments if you sit down and you talk to him about just, it. Just, right. search, <laughs> ser just search for articles, self-publishing versus publishers and see the cost and benefit. I think you would be convinced to publish it yourself. All right, I'll think about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I would, I, I would just say that I, I think that you know, the, like when I saw the, the the way of the strangers and I read that, you know, it's, it it seemed like it kind of grew out of uh, what ISIS really wants that article, and uh, I I think the Richard Spencer article you wrote just on the alt right and everything was a really fantastic article too. It'd be just great to see you have you have your take on that because I think there's some parallels there as well. Um, just in terms of group identity and nationalism and um, how all of that comes together. But I, yeah, again, great work. I and, mean, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of yours. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, is, is there anything else that you want to uh, close on? Anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I, I've been very grateful for your time as well. It's, it's really a privilege to be on your show. It's Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, to all of our uh, patrons, uh, we're just going to sign off. So, Thank you so um, much for your great great questions today. So thank you, everyone. You're right. Yeah. So uh, Razib, yeah, Razib Khan is one of the people who's also uh, listening to this. He's He also had a little bit of a thing with uh, Spencer at one point back in 2008. I used to write for his website way back when he was a libertarian. Uh, so that's another uh, connection. Um, Muskel, Michael, um, uh, Tully, Jim King, everybody, right. all you guys, whoever I'm not mentioning. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and um, hey. thank you. So Bye. we'll see you next time. The secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.